This is the Resilient Schools podcast on the Bee Podcast Network. I am the creator, Jethro Jones. In this podcast, we help schools become resilient, which means that they are able to adapt and overcome any situation that presents itself. Enjoy the show. This episode is from a previous interview that I did on the Transformative Principle podcast, and I'm collecting all of my trauma-informed podcasts and resources here on this feed. So if you're interested in more of that stuff, stay tuned to future episodes where we talk about how schools can be resilient and to get access to everything that I've got around trauma-informed practices in schools and resilient schools, go to resilientschools.com and then connect with me by putting your email in at the bottom of the page. Now, here's our episode from the vault. I'm very excited to have Tamara Fike on the program. Tamara is the founder of Love and a Big World that provides SEL solutions to schools all across the country. Thank you, Jethro. It's good to be with you. I am so excited to chat with you today. In the light of all these school closures that we had in the spring and some places, I think they're still not totally sure what school is going to look like this year. I thought with your SEL background, it would be good to try to talk to this idea of how to manage social and emotional learning with virtual learning and what that could look like. So let's start by talking about first the importance of SEL generally, and then we'll get into some ideas about how to make it work with virtual learning. So can you start by telling us why SEL is so important and maybe more important now than ever has been before? Yes. I would be glad to, Jethro. So social and emotional learning is really all about health and wellness for kids. It's related to their mental and emotional and social well-being, whether that's at home or at school. And with Love in a Big World, we define social and emotional learning as helping kids identify what's going on in their heads and in their hearts so they can use their hands to build up and not tear down. And now more than ever, we have to consider what kids are thinking about, how they're feeling about the global crisis that we are experiencing and how this has impacted them. For some, they may have experienced greater trauma at home because of a lack of food or other needs. Uh, For some, they may have experienced more trauma at home because of abuse, whether that was abuse that they witnessed between adults in their home or child abuse. So now more than ever, educators, government leaders are considering what do we need to put in place to help kids deal with the trauma, the anxiety, the fear of having been through this pandemic and then prepare them for learning. Yeah. And, and to be clear, we are, you know, recording this in at the end of April and we're going to publish it in August. So there's a lot of unknowns out there still, but I think one thing that you said that some students may go home to a better life because school is a traumatic place for them, while others may go away from a safe place, a better place to home where home is more traumatic to them and recognizing that those two realities and everything in between them and on either end of them all can exist within our own school. How do you prioritize and know how to help the kids that are in front of us, either virtually or physically? How do you know how to give them the best support possible? I think first and foremost, we have to consider Maslow, right? How are we dealing with those physical needs that the kids have? Are they eating? I mean, that's very basic, but there's millions of kids across America who right now are experiencing food instability because they're used to having breakfast and lunch at school. And now that school's not in session, they may not be getting that food. So I know that states, districts, schools, community organizations are scrambling to make sure that kids are being fed. I think that's, so that's primary I think we would be very negligent to think, though, that the trauma or the abuse or the pain of this pandemic for children 
is relegated to those who are in a lower socioeconomic situation. I talked with a friend of mine last week and he said, you know, I'm still working. My wife is still working. We're able to work from home. Our girls are with us. We've got our nuclear family that, and some extended family that we're quarantining with, but my girls are still saying that they don't get enough time with me, even though they're able to have lunch with me or take a walk with me during the day, they're just still feeling that, well, you're here, but you're not really here. So I think the need that kids have is for connection, whether that connection is with a parent or other adult within their home or a caring adult that has been a consistent part of their life over time, such as a teacher. So I believe we as educators have to come around the child as well as the family to help support those positive and healthy connections by any means necessary. Yeah. And so what does that look like by any means necessary? What should we be looking for to understand how to support families, whether it's virtually or in person? Let's focus on virtually. First and foremost, what I've been hearing from a lot of families is that they're overwhelmed with too many resources being provided. So I think a a very practical thing that we as educators can do is help prune back the amount of resources and give them clear and consistent direction. So I was on a call with another parent this morning and, and her kids are second grade kindergarten and maybe two years old. So she's saying, you know, I'm kind of the great test case for all this virtual learning that's happening. And she said one of the best strategies for her family is for them to follow the guidance that the teachers are providing about the resources because they're just being inundated right now. So I think as a as a district and as a school and as a classroom to give priority to, okay, we need to focus on reading and math. And then here are some extras that we can do. But even setting, helping families set realistic goals with homeschool, kids aren't needed to sit. They don't need to sit for seven hours. I mean, it's not a typical school day, but for elementary, it could look like one to two hours of schooling. For middle school, two to three hours. For high school, three to four hours. And and they're able to be compact in their approach to the learning because they're at home and they don't have all those transitions and all the other social interactions. So helping them with guidance for the academic. And that also alleviates a lot of stress and anxiety on the parent. And if you think about it, or the caregiver, as you think about it, that stress and anxiety that a parent feels trickles down to the child. So as we provide that support and guidance to the adults, that's going to positively impact the kids. I think that the set, so the pruning of the, of the resources would be number one. The second would be to encourage them, um, both families and children, that what comes first is their well being. So we want everyone to feel safe and secure. And we want them to make sure that they're taking care of themselves, whether that means in the middle of the day, they need to go out and ride a bike for half an hour or take a walk or play with their siblings who are in the home. But understanding that the pace of learning is different when it's at home than at school. And those play breaks are incredibly important. Just getting up and moving that physical exercise, that has an impact on the mental and emotional well-being of the child and the family as well. So to summarize, the pruning of the resources, keeping the whole family in mind, and then also just encouraging that whole child perspective in everything that kids and families do. Let's talk a little bit about the pruning of the resources. You know, here's one of my challenges. When schools so quickly said, oh, you don't have to do all the work that we've typically been doing and we're changing how we're delivering. Part of that is because there was a real crisis in in the pandemic. But the other part of that is that we recognized by saying that, that it's okay to not do all the stuff that we've been doing in school for so long. And to some people, that's really hard to hear and understand because we've, you know, you could say that we've been 
we've been pushing an agenda or pushing activities and things to do that haven't really been in the best interest of our kids if they are so quickly dropped when when the time comes. So how do we manage that? And how do we how do we prune those resources back, but not make it look like we're, quote unquote, giving up on education, which is what some critics have said about this situation? That's a good question, Jethro. And I think that we have to acknowledge what is most important for our kids and for our families. And we know that literacy, numeracy, and SEL skills are really at the top of the list. And so that's where our priorities need to be, especially for elementary kids. As you get into the older grades, we're looking at more problem-solving, teamwork. And I think some of that criticism is well well deserved, honestly, because the way that we've done school, particularly for the last 20 or so years as we've been teaching to the test, has not been effective. And that's exactly what employers are telling us when kids graduate and apply for jobs, is that they might be able to do a task, but they don't know how, I, how to work as a team. Or they might know, they might have content knowledge, but they don't know how to take direction from an authority figure. So these are those soft skills that we really need to focus on. And I think the virtual learning experience gives us a unique opportunity to provide both explicit instruction on what those skills are that kids need, as well as project-based learning opportunities where kids can go off into the real world, do the work, and then share back with us and really practice their problem solving. But that does require a different mindset for teaching. So it's not just the, I'm here as the expert, you're the child, you listen to me, or you do this project or that project, and then our worksheet, turn it in. It's, it's a very different way of doing school where we come along more as a facilitator or a coach to help them with their own progress. Yeah, I I think that that's absolutely the case. And the things that I've been um, talking about for the last several years around student-driven learning and the teacher being a compass instead of a sage on the stage, but a a compass for the students to help them keep their true north and know what direction they're heading. I've got a blog post I'm going to put in the show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast slash episode 344. Uh, so that you can you can look at that and and see that a little bit more. But if you think about the person who's doing who's the leader in the classroom, the teacher, and if they are taking an approach where they are being a compass for the students and they are helping them know which direction to head without saying, here's some explicit instruction about reading or math or whatever, but saying, here are some ways that I can help guide you down this path, it really allows the kids to do amazing things that we wouldn't have expected them to do before. And the kids actually rise to the occasion when those opportunities are presented to them, which is really an exciting thing that uh, that we all love to see in kids, but that we don't get to see very often because when we have a standard of what they're supposed to learn and we put it out there in front of them, once they meet that, many students will just stop and ask for the next direction because we're so they're so used to us giving them the next step all the time. So I really like that idea of, of changing the way that we, that we teach so that we, can, so that we can support them better. And as we think about that, how does SEL factor into that component? What role does it play when it's different? Because it's got to be different if that's how you're teaching and how you're teaching is different. And SEL has got to play a different role. What does that look like to you? Yes. And I I would love to share just real quickly before I dive into that, an article that I just released on the Learning Council um, called It's Time to Let Go of Control in Education (laughs) Uh, that speaks to exactly that. Um, So I'll share that link with you as well. With SEL, again, there's two ways that we need to think about it. One is being explicit with instruction and saying, okay, self-awareness is identifying our strengths and weaknesses. So we have to provide that explicit definition of what self-awareness is and then provide opportunities for kids to practice that on their own. They have to have some discovery of that. 
so that when they are then engaged in a project with some peers, which can be done virtually, they have an awareness of what is going on in their heads and in their hearts so that they can achieve the task together with the group. So I, I think about my, my oldest son, he is in college and most of his classes, even before the pandemic, were online classes. Part of that reason is because he's a football player and due to the rigor of football practice, it's easier for the, the athletes to have online classes. So he was working yesterday on a, a collaborative paper where he was responsible for a section and then there were four or five other people who were responsible for a section. Well, in order for him to accomplish that task, he had to be aware of his own interests as well as time and all of that that, ta that it takes to do a collaborative project in order to get it in when the assignment was due. So he was constantly in communication with the others on his team. They were working together much like we do in the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. But providing students, whether they're in college or whether they're in elementary school, that opportunity to practice those real world situations. What's it like to have a deliverable that's due at a certain time? That gives them the opportunity to practice those SEL skills in the real world. So that's where there's a combination of explicit instruction so that the children understand this is what I'm working on as a skill for SEL and then the practice of it in the real world. And then what we have to do is connect the dots and say, okay, when you did this task, you were practicing cooperation, you were working with others as a team, or when you made sure that you were communicating thoroughly with your teammates throughout the process, you were practicing courtesy, you were thinking of other, others first, you were minding your manners. And that helps them understand, oh, this is what I need to do, not only to get the job done with this particular assignment, but this is what I need to do in order to be an effective member of a team both in school and in the workplace and at home as well. Well, and I really like that example because part of the, the thing that changes so much with education, comparing it to the real world, is that your only audience in education is typically your teacher. Even if you're working on a group project with somebody else, the people that are going to see what you do really is the teacher and maybe your parents and maybe your classmates if you're going to do a presentation or something about it also. And so when you, when you have these different types of these different ways of learning, then your, your output, the having a deliverable and adding in an aspect of it, where it is actually a real deliverable and not just something that you're doing only because the teacher told you to, that changes also, because that makes it so that you can then think more about who's going to be reviewing this. And if it's just the teacher, then you would complete it one way. If it is the teacher and a community member who is thinking about investing in money in something at the school, that really changes how the kids respond to it and what they feel is important as they're doing the work. Because if it's just the teacher, she knows you, she can deal with whatever you turn in. But if it's somebody that you're trying to influence outside of the school, then there's a much higher need for you to, to really do a different and better job than you would otherwise think. Absolutely. And one of the things that my son mentioned to me yesterday too was that he was going to be peer reviewed for this project. And so that kept him on his toes because he knew, like you're saying, his audience was not just a teacher. His audience was his team members who were going to give feedback on how he contributed to the group work. And that, that was the accountability that he, in, all, in all honesty, I think he was more concerned about that point of accountability more than he wasn't great for the project. Yeah. And the reality is, is you recognize that the, the grades don't really mean anything anyway. And so you start to recognize, oh, you know what, this actually doesn't matter all that much if I don't get a good grade on this because I'm really learning amazing things. And what I think we need to do with some of that is we need to have a different paradigm than assignment, grade, uh, feedback that is a grade. And that kind of stuff, we've got to have a different way of managing all that. That's something else. For example, for summer school, we've got a bunch of kids that 
what we're trying to do is just make it so that they actually get credit for the time they spent in class. And tragically, a lot of kids finish the, a lot of classes with within 10% of getting a D minus so they'd actually get credit. And so we took a little different approach to summer of the school this year, and we're going to really focus on getting those kids credit so that they can get over the hump and get a D minus. And some people are saying, well, you're lowering expectations and, and all that because you're not, um, you're not pushing them to do better and do the best that they can. And the reality is, you know, that opportunity was had by the teacher. These kids fell just short for whatever reason. And now they're credit deficit, which means you basically have to take the whole class over again. And what we want to do is find a way for them to be able to get over that. Now, I'm telling you this because our traditional classroom system, our student information system, does not work well with that idea because the system is set up for the teacher to give an assignment to put in the computer, for the kid to do the assignment and turn it back in and get feedback and put that grade in the computer. And that's that's how it's built, but that's not going to work. So we're talking about using some project management apps to help us figure out how to keep track of what kids are doing so that we can say to that kid who needs to do three assignments compared to the other kid who needs to do seven assignments, what is it that we can do to show that you're knowing this? Not to mention the kid who just failed one test and that brought their grade down low enough that they got, you know, a 55%. Could they just retake that test and show that they understand it? So rethinking that paradigm of how we give work and grade work and give feedback on work in the schools. And there's a whole bunch more that goes into that, right? <laughs> and and so being able to find a way to to manage that. So my last question for you, Tamara, is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative leader like you? I would say take a cue from youth culture. Kids are learning and putting out work projects on a daily, if not hourly basis on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch. They're engaging all of their creative skills as well as their peers with the work products that they create. So what can we do in school to create that type of engagement and productivity? Sometimes I hear that kids are lazy or that they're not learning. And I turn that question around much in the same way that you do, Jethro. And I say, okay, what do we as adults need to change? Or what does the system as it is currently functioning need to change in order to be more in tune with what kids are actually doing and learning on a daily and hourly basis? So that, that would be my encouragement when we're considering transformation. I think it, it requires a paradigm shift. And instead of shunning what's happening in youth culture, embracing it and learning as many lessons as we can. And then looking at how do we change systems, much like you were talking about, in order to have a, have a true measure of students' productivity and learning. And I think that this reset that we're in is a perfect opportunity for us to make some, some of those changes. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I love that idea of, of recognizing and valuing the learning that kids are doing outside of the four walls of the school, because that really is a key. If you can value and recognize that they are learning outside of your school, you can bring all that learning in and take advantage of that opportunity to see what they're doing and to build better relationships, understand them better when they make a mistake, you can talk about it. I just think that that is such great advice to take a cue from youth culture. Tamara, how do people get in touch with you and learn more from you and about you? Well, they can email me at Tamara, T-A-M-A-R-A at loveinabigworld.org or check out the website, loveinabigworld.org. And also check out a new show that we've been doing through the pandemic and beyond called Music City Kids. Thank you, Jethro. It was my pleasure. 